yeah, so just, just to kind of um, give a bit of a, a, a disclaimer here, especially as Charlotte's here, um, who has written, I know, um, a lot on smuggling in Cornwall. Um, yeah, this is a new area of research for me. So um, I normally work on pirates and I normally work on the 17th century. So my venturing into the 18th and 19th century and smugglers um, is a new venture for me. Um, and kind of within this talk, I'm going to talk... Um, kind of give an overview of sort of some of the ideas around smuggling and some of this of course it's romanticized um, and as part of my research what I'm hoping to do what I'm hoping to go on to do is actually separate out this kind of the romanticization of smuggling the idealization of smuggling from whatever we can glean from the historical record which of course um, we were having a conversation prior to um, to sort of letting everybody in about how difficult it actually is to find records of kind of you know activities that were basically going on under the radar um we have newspapers and we have which i've started going through but of course this is a very top-down perspective so you know do kind of bear that in mind that this is work in progress so at the end of this session rather than questions as such um it'd be really useful to have more of a discussion around kind of smuggling and people's thoughts and an understanding of smuggling and perhaps as I say some of this interesting family history that we've got. So also I want to think about um, you know whether smuggling in this era can be considered organized crime executed ruthlessly and with no hesitation to use violence and intimidation against those who threaten to disrupt smuggling or whether the so-called free trade um, was a radical act enabling those in poverty to have access to certain goods and also to make a living. You know, whether smuggling as a whole community industry created a sense of community and belonging. And even a way, you know, if we take this to an extreme, even a way for those in Cornwall to hit back against the English state, you know, that's, that's kind of some of the questions that I, I want us to think about. So the 18th and 19th century were the height of the smuggling era and popular representations of these smugglers have become embedded in our collective imagination. The small band of stock characters, lovable rogues of the lower orders who land small amounts of contraband, tobacco or spirit on the beach of a secluded moonlit cove. So this is certainly the familiar image um, of what, what was termed the free trade. So, as I say, to what extent is this supported by the historical record and to what extent is this romanticised, that is idealised, um, made seem more appealing than it actually was? You know, is there a nostalgic element here with later representation? So, you know, is there a nostalgic element to to kind of, you know, and I think that there definitely is, you know, this is kind of what, what you know, it's quite obvious in many ways. Um, but, you know, I want us to think kind of in, in a little more depth about this. You know, some, some aspects of the popular understanding of, of smuggling is indeed rooted in historical practices, the practices of historical smuggling. Um, although I will say that many of the images, because it was quite hard to find images, and I, I wanted pretty pictures, um, rather than everybody just looking at me, um, many of the images are romanticized. It's very hard to find any images that aren't actually romanticized images. Um, so several of them, for example, are paintings by the, in, from the early 19th century by Henry Purley Parker, who was known for his melodramatic paintings, for example, of, of smuggling. Um, so if you want to look him up, he had a whole series and an ex exhibition of, of his smuggling paintings. But of course, many of these um, romantic embellishments are a product of even later fiction. So we have, of course, Daphne du Maurier's Jamaica Inn, and we have Moonfleet um, by John Mead Faulkner and novels which have both been adapted for film and, and television. And often we see that smuggling, wrecking or, or kind of popular understandings of wrecking and piracy have been conflated. So we see that in the um, pub sign here, for example, for Jamaica Inn. Um, and we see it on the sign as well in the, the Smugglers Museum at Jamaica Inn and, and kind of and so on. And this was a picture, actually, the painting there was tweeted um, by Jamaica Inn. Um, you know, obviously we can talk, I mean, I haven't really gone into this in this talk, but the whole kind of tourist industry aspect around smuggling in Cornwall, which is a whole other kind of area. Um, but rather than this kind of small band of, of rogues operating on moonlit nights, landing small amounts of contraband, 
The historical record reveals a different story, that of a well-organized and highly profitable industry involving all strata of society. And overall, the, the enterprise involves strategic planning, cunning, calculated risk-taking, and yes, often extreme violence, particularly towards informers or during encounters with the preventative men. And those involved in the industry, and it, it was an industry, took a variety of roles. Um, from the specialist boat builders, and I'm kind of thinking, yeah, the specialist boat builders. I think I've got an image there. No, okay, ignore that. Specialist boat builders um, and skilled seafarers to investors and, and accountants, and all those who could move, hide, buy, and sell the astonishing range of goods smuggled in to avoid heavy taxation. Huge profits were to be gained and collusion with the authorities were rife. For de many decades, the forces of repression were largely ineffectual with many revenue officers and preventative men themselves being corrupt. Fundamentally, however, this was an illicit trade created by the economic strategies of successive governments, imposing punitive taxation to pay for wars in Europe. Although taxes eased at times to ease smuggling activities during this period, it was, uns it was unsurprisingly persistent because of the profit that could be made. And this was a trade in which tens of thousands of people were involved in any one time um, during this period. Um, smuggling enabled not only luxury goods to be available and affordable, but also more essential items, such as salt, which was crucial in Cornwall for the expanding fishing industry. Tea, tobacco and brandy were common items, along with gin and rum. And we can see here um, an extract from the smuggler, a smuggler's song by Rudyard Kipling. Five and twenty ponies trotting through the dark, brandy for the pars parson, backy for the clerk, laces for a lady, letters for a spy, watch the wall, my darling, while the gentlemen go by. You know, kind of really giving this sense of community collusion. Taxation on certain goods was extremely heavy, um, sometimes up to 250%. With such high levels of duty, smuggling was rife throughout the British Isles, an extremely lucrative venture that was worth the risks involved. And any um, heavily taxed goods was smuggled. So although we kind of think about tobacco and, and tea and, and brandy, um, you know, this, the smuggled goods varied over time, but included handkerchiefs and cloth, so cotton, muslin, velvet, silk, dried fruits, oil, leather, writing paper, iron, soap, hemp, coffee, glass, um, playing cards, um, vinegar, starch, china, pepper, um, across, the, across the board. And, and of course, um, for some goods such as silk, which was subject to um, bans of being imported from time to time, the only way to kind of meet the demand was through smuggling. Estimates from the 1780s reveal a huge industry with enormous losses to the revenue. For example, it, it was estimated that four fifths of the tea drunk in Britain during the 18th century was smuggled, with a quarter of that coming through Devon and Cornwall, along with half of the brandy. And at times, um, gin was so plentiful, um, and this, this is, it was in Kent in particular, it was said that locals used it to clean their windows. I mean, I've never tried that, but possibly it's a good cleaning agent. Um, and indeed, drunkenness and alcohol poisoning was a huge concern for many in authority. Smuggled spirits were supplied um, directly from the still and transported undiluted, so they were overproof. An even larger pro profit could then be made um, by dilution once the spirits were landed. And the spirits were let down with various substances to drinking strength. They were also colourless, so burnt sugar would be added to brandy. Inevitably, of course, there were um, cases of alcohol poisoning resulting in death from people drinking overproof spirits. Um, there were many cases that uh, I noted in, in when I, I started going through the newspapers. Um, but one, um, one, for example, in 1791 was Thomas Jenkins, master of the vessel of the Swansea trader, who died after drinking an anchor of gin over 16 days at Plimstock. Okay. <laughs> so that's quite a lot of gin. Um, I think eight, eight and a, eight and a something gallon. I think. So spirits were so plentiful that even those on parish relief were given an allowance. 
Um, so, for example, Margaret Foote of Sydney in Cornwall was allocated over one and a half gallons of brandy over a 12 week period in 1755. The price is indicating um, that, her, that this brandy was must have been smuggled. So enormous wealth um, could be made in an area, but conversely, a large cargo of smuggled goods could drain a locale of cash. This was the case when three East India men returning from China anchored at Falmouth and for a fortnight held an onboard sale of silks, muslins, tea, porcelain, handkerchiefs, arrack and other goods, all duty free. The town was reported to be filled with people from all ranks of the population and the ships raked in £20,000, leaving many with no cash to spend elsewhere. So, of course, Devon and Cornwall ideally situated for smuggling with coasts facing two major trading routes. Cornwall, especially well positioned, having many remote coves and beaches, often inaccessible to land patrols, having a population of highly skilled seafarers and boat builders who could build modified smuggling vessels to order. And here I think these are uh, uh, apparently um, two plans for two smuggling vessels, one the ferret of Foy, um, a one mass smuggler, and the lottery or lottery, I can't kind of make that out, um, a two mast smuggler. And of course, you know, Cornwall also has a history of trade links to the centres um, exporting goods to be smuggled in, such as Western France. So smuggled goods mainly came in from Brittany and the Channel Islands. Warehouses and merchants based on Guernsey with French traders um, shipping goods. So they would ship the goods to Guernsey and that would be how they would come in. Fortunes were also made. So this had a kind of knock on industry um, and fortunes were also made there through the manufacture of tubs, of casks, of ropes and bales, which were needed to transport the smuggled goods. So this really is a whole industry. It's not just a kind of small band of ne'er-do-wells um, involved in this. And during this period, the population, of course, of Cornwall is largely dependent on, on either directly or indirectly on maritime industry. So whole communities were involved in various levels of smuggling, some to the point of economic dependence. Large swathes of the population were in poverty, subject to low wages, and the key occupations such as mining, fishing and agriculture were subject to seasonal variation. But these occupations, so, you know, why not become involved in smuggling? But these occupations also gave intimate knowledge and understanding of the local area, of the land, of the sea, of the subterranean. So these were all vital for smuggling missions. 18th century Cornwall saw the growth of the fishing industry, resulting in increased shipping and opportunities for smuggling. But it also meant the need for more salt, which was a primary item of contraband. Furthermore, the deep mining boom during the same era meant a huge labour force was created in Cornwall, producing a strong localised market for smuggled goods, particularly spirits. And on the side, we see um, an 18th century, I think it's 18th century, um, drawing of Dolcove Mine, for example. The majority of goods smuggled into Cornwall appear to have been sold and consumed in Cornwall. Cornwall's, mi Cornwall's miners were also actively involved in the free trade. Alluvial tin miners and streamers in West Cornwall could be laid off in summer um, when there were water shortages. Um, so trips to Roscoff and Guernsey um, were an attractive and profitable change to those who spent their working lives underground. During the six, 1750s, Cornwall was, was described as um, swarming with smugglers. And this was not only in isolated areas. Falmouth, for example, saw um, the free trade boom with the collusion of local authorities and the inherent difficulties customs and preventative men had over controlling the free trade. And the Isles of Scilly was um, said to be so reliant on smuggling that when customs finally got a hold there in the early part of the 19th century, there were fears that the population could starve. Um, and this has been linked to, um, and this is something I want to explore in more depth, but this has been linked to the, um, the growth of the flower trade there to actually um, replace smuggling. So, you know, this, this was people looking for new ways to kind of earn uh, money. So most of these smugglers, um, and here's a, a lovely photograph of, of um, Paul Perro, 19th century photograph of Paul Perro, of course, notorious for smuggling. Most sea smugglers were seafaring men, um, often fishermen, and the seasonal and precarious nature of fishing 
meant that fishermen could use their local knowledge and sea skills to undertake smuggling missions. Many slipped between legitimate employment and smuggling, often using fishing to cover up, sometimes literally using fishing to fish to cover up um, their illegal endeavours. The smugglers were highly motivated and skilled at handling their vessels, including in bad weather when the risk of detection was decreased. And the prevention men or the king's men were not as skilled and not as motivated. They were often the worst seamen um, in the Navy, serving against their will and then put to work on the customs vessels, labour which was both poorly paid and, of course, risky. The riding officers who individually patrolled their own assigned stretch of the coast had to supply their own horses. I was surprised to find that out, actually. Um, Benjamin Elliott, a riding officer based in Marazion, which is where I am now, um, suffered the loss of four horses in a little over a year, which would have been devastating financially and I would expect, I would hope, emotionally as well. It was not until 1822 that the Coast Guard Service was established bringing various prevention services together. Those who joined up for the service had to be away from their home areas to avoid collusion and intimidation. Nevertheless, although the prevention service improved, smuggling in Cornwall lasted a lot longer than it seems to have done elsewhere. So I just wanna talk a little bit about the process of actually landing um, goods, something that I found quite interesting. Again, it's kind of, it's such an industry, a highly organized industry. So the process had to be carefully planned with remote bays and coves well known to locals, the chosen sites. Smuggling vessels were specially built or altered to be faster and more nimble than the prevention ships and were often painted black. So moonlight, the romantic image of moonlight, but moonlight was not actually helpful to the smuggling operation. And although some landings as we see, see here could be made in daylight, this had to be in very remote areas. So the vessel was brought in sight of shore at a pre-arranged landing point and it would communicate in various ways with those on the land to ensure a safe landing point where the cargo could be swiftly unloaded. Tub carriers or tubmen landed and moved the contraband. These were usually poor landless labourers but could involve other members of the community. For example, women and children were often involved. But this was highly physical work. Um, inaccessible coves meant kegs and bales would have to, be, have to be transported up sheer cliffs using ropes and rope ladders, sometimes with horse powered winches to a crew waiting to load the contraband into carts or onto caravans of ponies. Negotiating a hundred foot drop in the dark was clearly dangerous and there are some deaths recorded um, as a result. Whilst legitimate trading would convey merchandise in large barrels or packages, illicit goods had to be easily transported and hidden. So they were packaged in far smaller quantities. Dry goods such as tobacco or tea were wrapped in watertight oil skin in case they needed to be thrown overboard or on the beach to be transported by a cart, say under kelp or under fish, for example. Spirits came in small barrels or tubs, half anchors, which were a little over four, ga four gallons, although anchors, eight and a third gallons, was sometimes used. And of course, that's what the unfortunate master um, of the ship had drunk over his 16 days, probably overproof um, before he died. Anchors had flattened sides so they could easily be carried and were usually in a pair roped together so the tubman could parry, carry a pair of half anchors across their shoulders, one at the front and one at the back. Um, but this in itself was risky, it could cause injury and make breathing difficult. And sometimes tubmen would need to carry these for many miles at a brisk pace. If ponies were used, the rope slings would fit over their backs. Further members of the landing crew were batmen, who were those prepared to undertake violence to ensure the king's men did not interfere. And of course, the landing carried the most risk of being caught. Um, and batmen would defend the tub carriers with weapons such as clubs and handguns. And some smuggling gangs retained the services of a trusted surgeon to treat injuries, and they would be rewarded with contraband. Another crucial role was that of the spotsman, who knew the coast and creeks intimately and could make out features even on the darkest nights in poor conditions. They would guide the vessel into a position from where all the prearranged landing or signaling points could be seen. The exact spot for landing would not be made until the last possible moment due to the risk of discovery. Therefore, sig the signaling between land and sea was crucial. So, 
The sportsman would usually signal through um, a spark or a flash from a flintlock pistol, um, apparently. Need to look into this a bit more. Um, which produced a distinctive blue light. Waving lanterns on shore was not really an option um, as there were stiff penalties for signaling to ships at sea. And indeed there were stiff penalties for ships hovering, as it was called, off the coast. Any lights coming from on land had to be designed to only be seen at sea. Um, so, or from sea caves. So windows were deliberately constructed in order to just face out to sea, and a spout lantern shown here was developed to focus a beam out to sea. Fires could be lit to warn ve vessels of discovery or to distract the prevention men, but again, this was illegal. Um, sometimes with daylight landings, it was reported smoke could be used as a signal by using wet gauze or bracken. Other signals um, that I've come across um, involved whistling a tune, tethering animals in an agreed pattern, um, particular colours hung on a washing line, um, messages sent, I mean this is one from Kent, but messages sent along a row of houses using rods up a chimney. Um, <laughs> it's absolutely fascinating. Um, and importantly, but importantly, all these signals had to be fast. They had to be faster than the prevention men, um, faster than they could ride. And certainly a smuggling vessel could, could in Cornwall could travel a lot faster than a mounted officer could along the coast path. Um, and by the time the French men got there, it could be all be over. So as I say, speed was crucial. So sometimes there was hundreds of people helping out with these endeavors, um, ensuring efficiency, but also a deterrent to the prevention men. Of course, there might only be one or two. So these were some of the tactics um, used. So barrels were, were also lashed together to form a raft, uh, which could be weighted so it floated just beneath the water, um, known popularly as sowing a crop. Um, and actually there's reports of this happening to um, high contraband in rivers and ponds as well as at sea. Um, tubs of spirits could be tied to stones uh, with holes in, so underwater, or to anchors retrieved through a process known as creeping with a special tool, which is shown here. Um, and, and this would, would be the prevention men would, would undertake creeping or, or the smugglers themselves. If sunken alcohol had become tainted with seawater, in the West Country it was then known as stinky bus or stinky booze. Um, and I'm assuming it was still drunk. <laughs> so ponies and horses, um, and I really want to look into this, this a lot more, actually. Um, very important smugglers, um, and also ponies being used in mining as well. I, I would like to kind of do some stuff on ponies. Um, so ponies and horses, very important smugglers. And locals were said to leave stable doors and locked overnight to loan horses. A report on smuggling in the 1780s stated that a fifth of all the horses in Britain were being used in service of the free traders. And smugglers were said to train their horses to bolt when they were told to woe by the prevention men or be shaved and soaked or oiled to make their capture more difficult and their hooves muffled with rags. They could also be trained to return home, even if a smuggler, the smuggler themselves had to hide, as happened in St. Earth when a smuggler had to hide beneath a bridge um, after being pursued by prevention men. Of course, the horses were at risk too. Um, and I found a newspaper report in, uh, from 1801, which tells of a smuggler's horse drowning um, near Truro when being chased by prevention men, although the smuggler did get away, but not with the brandy. So hiding contraband. Um, hiding contraband once landed was very important. And inns, of course, you know, we still have this, this tradition of, of inns being associated with the tourist industry with smuggling and so on. Um, and of course, inns were the most common hiding place, as well as being used by smugglers for planning ventures and sales. The small beer houses in Cornwall known as Winks or Kidley Winks were a prominent aspect of the free trade. Officially only licensed to sell beer, these premises could be little more than a small house, but they notoriously traded smuggled spirits. And these were usually kept in a kettle with customers indicating their desire for something stronger with a wink. Um, so it could come from kettle wink, kiddly wink, kettle wink. Who knows? Don't know. I think so. 
caves and tunnels were also used as hiding places and of course smugglers tunnels um you know are notoriously associated um uh, with smuggling probably far too too much than than the reality um you know in the romantic tales often you know smugglers tunnels are, are a big part of that um but of course you know tunnels have been discovered and um, there was recently a discovered um tunnel going from uh, penzance waterfront um warehouse um abbey on abbey slip going to the admiral benbow pub on nearby chapel street and this is an image of um not me <laughs> somebody bravely going down the tunnel church towers and tombs were also used or under stable floors with horses or dung on top um, or under fireplace places with a, a fire burning to prevent investigation and mines were also used for storage being close to the coast and also having useful drainage adits and shafts and spirits and tobacco um, were found on occasion in the mine workings at St Just um, in West Cornwall and on one such search um, a prevention man fell down the shaft to his death. This incident could have been linked to a local smuggler Thomas Hicks he met his own demise after he set off in an open boat with seven men to fetch goods from a smuggler's lugger lying offshore at Priest Cove. On the return journey, he and four of the crewmen drowned. And of course, sometimes um, these are packet ships, because um, sometimes foreign ships would just anchor offshore and simply sell goods um, duty free to straight to the population. Although after 1718, it was illegal for vessels to hover offshore. So in addition to the homeward bound East India men anchoring at Falmouth, another way goods was brought in, were brought in was via the Falmouth packet ships. Um, the packet ships have run an international colonial mail service out of Falmouth since 1688, also carrying passengers and bullion, and was thus a vital part of colonial power at the height of the transatlantic trafficking of enslaved people and the wealth plantation labour brought to Britain, which of course produced many of these smuggled goods. The privileged position of the ships meant that they were exempt from searches by customs and crews undertook their own private trading in duty-free goods. Indeed, they were often spotted illegally hovering offshore. When in 1785, the post office tried to put a stop to this smuggling trade, the crews refused to go, refused to, go to sea. The post office were forced to raise the wages and pay the men a food allowance, but the smuggling still continued. In 1810, a very keen customs officer broke open the private chests of crew members on an outgoing packet and seized the contents. Again, the packet crews refused to go to sea. In response, the authorities pressed 13 men from each packet ship crew into the Navy. And local outrage was substantial. The mayor was forced to read the riot act, militia were dispatched, and the packet service had to be temporarily transferred, transferred to Plymouth. So the free trade differed, I think, in Cornwall from elsewhere, as it tended to be more integrated into communities. Um, and, and this is the painting I was talking about in, in the chat, the arrest of the smuggler in West Loo, which I think. I think it has a really community feel to it, which is why I wanted to include it here. And the fact that it's hanging in the guild hall as well. Um, financing of smuggling runs was undertaken more communally in Cornwall, um, with a range of people investing in voyages and taking a share. And often those who organised the runs also owned the boats and distributed the contraband. As almost everyone in the community was involved, this did reduce the risk of being informed upon. It also meant that Cornish smugglers had less reputation for violence within the community, although with the prevention men, that wasn't so much the case. There were rare reports of community violence um, related to the free trade. And I know this isn't very clear. Um, it's a sketch and it is very faint. It's in the Tate. Um, but this was the case of in 1792 of Martha Blewett of Mousel who was murdered on the road between Mousel and Paul in the far west of Cornwall for the money she had made selling untaxed smuggled salt. A fisherman was later convicted and hung for the crime and there was a memorial constructed on the road to her memory and this is a sketch from 1811. Um, I, I don't know if there's any trace of this at all now um, but obviously we have this sketch in the record of it. I thought that was quite interesting. It was a, a new one new one on me. 
We also have um, cases of informants being murdered. And again, this is where legend kind of a myth take over. The story of Anne George, wife of the innkeeper at the then called Senan Inn, the now first and last, is particularly notorious and informed on local, uh, local smugglers, including her landlord Di Dionysus Williams and the known counterfeiter and smuggler Christopher Pollard. Pollard was acquitted, but Anne was said to have been murdered for her loose tongue by being tied to a stake at Senan Cove and left to drown and then buried in an unmarked spot in the graveyard next to the inn. Her ghost is, of course, said to haunt the pub. You know, this, this is where we have these kind of narratives coming in. But of course, we can't get away from the fact that the supernatural um, plays a part in smuggling stories. And this is where my literature head comes into play. So tales of hauntings could be used to keep and welcome visitors away. The Reverend Richard Dodd, vicar at Talland between 1713 and 1746, which was near the infamous smuggling village of Paul Perrow, was said to be able to raise the dead at will and drive devils and evil spirits out of the churchyard down a particular lane towards the sea. Dodge's reputation meant conveniently that parish parishioners were frightened of meeting him at night. And it just so happens that this lane was also a notorious smuggling path. Um, so it was seen that these kind of stories, and there are other instances of these stories in Devon as well, were designed to keep people away uh, when smuggling was, was going on. And just, Kind of finally, really, I, I want to sort of raise the issue of women, um, women being involved in the, in the trade. Um, it tended to be with the movement of goods and they tended to be land smugglers rather than sea smugglers, transporting, selling and distributing contraband. So women like the unfortunate Martha Blewett were relied upon for distributing the untaxed salt, so vital for the fishing industry. The salt would be carried in sacks on their backs and if spotted by prevention men, they would slice the sack open quickly to destroy the evidence. But women could also pretend to be pregnant, wearing conveniently voluminous clothing in order to hide and transport contraband. They would not be subject to searches by customs officials, although it was observed that loose clothing could suddenly become a lot tighter on a return, return trip from the coves and the harbours. Women would carry spirits in pig's bladders or pig skin under their clothing. And as with salt, evidence could easily be destroyed if the containers were punctured. Again, women, and this is where the, the term skinful, having a skinful um, seems to have come from, because the women with a skinful of spirits could not legally be searched, usually claiming pregnancy to explain these swellings. And women also provided alibis um, for smugglers and assistance in other ways, including something, sometimes fighting off revenue men. And I've come across one gang of women, female smugglers, but that was in Scotland. So it would be lovely to find one down here. So just to, to kind of pose this question then really, um, many smugglers embraced the idea of themselves as free traders, offering a service supplying cheap and usually unobtainable goods, items out of reach for many ordinary people. There is also an element perhaps of this radical action, which can be interpreted as taking place um, through the actions of smuggling at this time. And there was certainly this solidarity within a community, including local officials, such as churchmen, magistrates, mayors, as well as ordinary people um, being actively involved. And I've got several instances of, of kind of customs where warehouses being targeted um, by smugglers to steal their goods back, but they would leave other people's goods there. They wouldn't just, arbitrary like take everything there was a case in Penzance of the Carter brothers just just kind of taking their own confiscated goods but leaving everybody else's um, and also kind of other cases of um, you know smuggled goods being kind of um, rescued <laughs> from the smuggling men um, you know in, in kind of missions that would leave other goods there so you know can Cornish smuggling be viewed as rebellion of ordinary communities against the London-based um, centres of power? Can it be considered rad radical action? Or is this just another form of romanticizing violent criminal activity? And just to kind of, you know, just to completely finish here with my little end note, um, because of course, you know, smuggling has been very important for Cornwall and the Southwest um, maritime social history, but also woven into narrative and um, folkloric history. Um, speaks of resistance, it speaks of the distribution of power, it speaks to colonialism, conflict, interweaving romance, rebellion and geopolitics, um, and also given this gloss to appeal to tourists. 
and it has like pirates an enduring fascination. But of course, this is a practice like piracy that isn't consigned merely to the past. It's changed over time in response to worldwide political and economic context. And whilst wherever governments attempt to stop or tax the movement of goods, smuggling will follow. Originally, smuggling uh, referred to illicit goods without paying duties, you know, without paying the taxes on them. But of course, this is still true today with tobacco and alcohol, for example. But it's also become um, used to refer to bringing in illegal items such as drugs or weapons or animals and foodstuff, or more significantly, people smuggling and cross-border human trafficking. And I think, you know, when we talk about this historically, like with piracy, when we have this gloss of romance, and then we look at it today, can we really look at this in a, a romantic, nostalgic fashion? That's my question. Thank you. And sorry for the technical hitch at the beginning. Thank you, Joe. That was fantastic. Um, if I could ask Joe to stop screen sharing so I can 